Valley wet prairies are one of the lesser known habitats, but are the most endangered ecosystems in the valley. More than 99% of this valuable resource has been lost since the Willamette Valley was settled by Euro-Americans over the last 150 years. This unique grassland is very much a product of Oregon's climate and the unique geomorphology of the Willamette River. The native grasses and wildflowers that characterize the prairie became established with a regime of winter floods and summer fires following western Oregon's wet winters and dry summers. The Willamette Valley stretches from Eugene in the south to Portland and the confluence with the Columbia River in the north. The wide valley is framed by the Coast Range Mountains to the west and the volcanoes of the Cascades to the east. Today, the valley is largely dominated by agriculture, with only very sparse remnants of the landscape that existed before Euro-American settlement in the mid-19th century. As scientists, conservationists, and even farmers have come to understand the importance of these unique wetlands in the Willamette Valley, efforts have been made to protect what is left and start to restore these endangered landscapes. I think the reason that there's been so much emphasis on trying to maintain it is because they do provide so many important services that humans like can actually feel in terms of their flood control and stormwater uh, ability to you know to cleanse our waterways and so that's being increasingly recognized that we need this ecosystem and it's also I think that there is a cultural value at least personally put on maintaining biodiversity and um, we realize without this ecosystem that much of that biodiversity would be lost and I think that's why the emphasis is there. As conservation and restoration become more prominent it begs the question what did the Willamette Valley landscape look like before the prairie habitats became fragmented. How widespread were these habitats in the past? How long were wet prairies in existence before agriculture and settlement fundamentally altered the landscape? And is it possible for the Willamette Valley to look anything like the one of the past? More than 13,000 years ago, a series of the greatest floods ever known filled the Willamette Valley with fresh water and sediment. This water had been stored in a massive lake in western Montana, where the extension of a continental ice sheet covering most of Canada acted as a dam. Periodically, the ice dam gave way, releasing waves of floodwaters that traveled through northern Idaho across eastern Washington to the Columbia River before heading through the Columbia Gorge and making their way out to the Pacific Ocean. Parts of the Columbia Channel could not contain this immense volume of water. And when the floods made their way through the area that Portland occupies today, enough water was diverted from the Columbia to fill up almost the entire Willamette Valley. During the days and weeks that the valley became a lake, silts and fine sands scoured from eastern Washington were deposited as layers of sediment several meters thick in the valley. This sediment is a major reason why the valley is so fertile and productive for agriculture today. However, these soils are also provided the base for many other natural vegetation types that existed in the thousands of years between the Missoula floods and the development of agriculture in the Willamette Valley. Our knowledge and understanding of the conditions that currently support remnant wet prairie provide one avenue to explore where this habitat may have existed in the past. Since the last of the Missoula floods, the topography and soils of the Willamette Valley have remained fairly stable. So it might make sense to infer that the wet prairies occupied all of the space in the valley that matched the characteristics of the areas where we still find wet prairie today. These characteristics include things such as natural depressions in the valley and soils that were formed in wet environments. As this map shows, these conditions are quite extensive throughout the valley. But there are other aspects of the physical geography that also control the distribution of the wet prairie. And some of these components have changed drastically over the millennia, both in natural ways and at the hands of human development. Climate, for instance, is a very dynamic component of the Earth's system that plays a great role in forming and controlling different habitat types. Desert, forest, and grasslands are three very different ecosystems that exist in Oregon, and their distributions are largely controlled by climate. 
In fact, climate and vegetation have such a well-understood relationship that much of what we know about past climates is based on what we know about past vegetation. A record of the past vegetation in the Willamette Valley is neatly stored in the sediments at the bottom of lakes throughout the valley. The surfaces of these lakes act as collectors of pollen released from all the local plants. The pollen, along with all the other debris and sediment in the lake, collects year after year and slowly sinks, forming layers at the bottom of the lake. Over thousands of years, these deposits stack up, creating a chronology of sediment that holds a record of the types of local and regional vegetation. Scientists interested in recreating past landscapes can extract the cores of lake sediments and count the pollen grains found at different depths. These can then be used to reconstruct the vegetation of the past. Lake sediments also reveal the history of fire on the landscape, how frequent it was, and even the type of plants that burned. Charcoal left behind from grass has a different shape and texture compared to the charcoal from woody trees. Scientists have reconstructed the fire and vegetation histories at different places throughout the Willamette Valley, and the results add a very interesting dimension to the history of the wet prairie ecosystem. So disturbance is absolutely necessary to maintain these wetland prairies, um, otherwise you'll get encroachment by woody shrub species and tree species. Um, fire is not the only type of disturbance that these ecosystems can have, although it's the historic one. Um, it has several advantages, other, other disturbances like mowing, in that it's much more heterogeneous in nature, so on both a spatial scale as well as an intensity of the burn. And so it opens up landscapes in different ways than would happen if you were just to go through with a mower, for example. Um, also, by burning off that thatch layer, you create a more open space and a nutrient flush back to the system by the ash then settling back down on the soils. Um, so in several ways it has a lot of advantages, but often it's not practical, um, especially when you're close to urban areas. So um, these other means of disturbances like uh, mowing would be a good alternative. And I should also mention that actually a large part of historic disturbance in this valley were by small mammals, and so you wouldn't think that they could have too big an effect, but these gophers or other bulls uh, can actually come through and create some of that disturbance for you as well. Two different sites in the valley record a period of frequent fires in the early and middle Holocene, when the climate was warmer and drier than today. But as the climate cooled, only one of these sites shows a transition to less frequent fire and to the types of trees that require longer periods without fire. At the other site, fires and grasses continued to persist into the period of a cooler climate. This puzzling finding demands an explanation, and the experts best suited to provide it may be archaeologists rather than climatologists or ecologists. Native Americans have occupied parts of the Willamette Valley for thousands of years, taking advantage of the bounty provided by the prairies and savannas. This bounty, the Native people learned, could be maximized with just the right amount of fire. Burning maintained an adequate supply of acorns, camas bulbs, and killed trees and shrubs that would naturally invade the prairie otherwise. So the Native Americans had the motive and the skills to perpetuate prairie habitat in the Willamette Valley, even as the climate was gradually cooling and favoring other types of plants. By the time European settlers arrived in the valley in the mid-19th century, expansive prairies still existed, partly by virtue of the deliberate burning by the native people. But it would not be long before the new inhabitants of the valley developed their own methods for exploiting the natural resources of the valley. And these methods involved much more engineering than the patchy seasonal fires used by the native people. To the settlers, the Willamette Valley was ripe for agricultural development and this meant harnessing the Willamette River itself and generally asserting control over the dynamic hydrology of the whole valley. Wet prairie habitat of the Willamette Valley dominates areas that are seasonally inundated by water, either due to flooding or a persistently high water table. Historically, the Willamette River and its tributaries provided an abundance of this type of habitat. The river itself was composed of an intricate network of intersecting channels separated by islands. 
Because the river had a very wide course with many different paths, the channels remained relatively shallow, allowing seasonal floods to easily spill out onto the surrounding plains. So wet prairies in the Willamette Valley used to be very extensive um, ecosystem, pretty much dominating much of the Willamette Valley with upland prairies and savannas kind of feeding into that. Um, the Willamette Valley itself, the Willamette was not this major channel that you see today, but instead you had a lot of braiding of the river channels coming off that allowed for the seasonal flooding of prairies on the valley floor. When settlers arrived with their desire for easier river navigation, many changes to the river were engineered. Side channels were closed off, small islands and bars were removed, all with the intent of combining more flow to the main river channel. With increased flow in the main channel, the Willamette began cutting or incising its channels at faster and faster rates. This made the channel deeper, better for navigation by boats, but it also fundamentally altered the natural flooding regime in the valley. Now, only the largest floods, like those in 1964, can spill out onto the floodplain. Now that we have an idea of how the valley looked in the past, what does the future hold for this endangered ecosystem? Scientists and conservationists hope that restoration efforts such as conservation reserve programs, wildlife refuges, and other direct restoration projects like the West Eugene Wetlands will help to preserve this ecosystem for the future. So the goals of wetland restoration are varied depending on the system and I think that's really important when you think about restoring these wetland prairies is that you have to think about the unique geography of each location. Um, I think the, probably the number one criteria that people think about when restoring wetland prairies is to recreate that intact hydrology. So in some cases you might already be there and that, that hydrology may still be intact in which case you can just move forward, but otherwise it, this may require opening up channels to allow it to flood again, taking off fill um, that was added for agricultural purposes. Uh, once you have that hydrology uh, restored, and I should mention that you also might want to increase microtopography at this point because often these wet prairies have been leveled and that's not characteristics of how they used to look. So they used to be this inundating um, kind of subtle swales throughout the landscape. So once you have that hydrology intact, then you need to make a decision about the vegetation that's there. If it's got a large native component to it still, you might decide just to let it go and add some extra seeds to help it along extra native um, propagals. But uh, if it's pretty much dominated by aggressive introduced species, I think at that point you would make the decision to try to kill the existing vegetation and then bring in a native sources of seeds and plant materials. Restoration projects need not fixate on what the patch of land looked like at a certain time in the past. The understanding that the landscape has always been dynamic and is continually changing even under natural conditions allows for new conservation goals. Increasingly, the focus on restoration around the Willamette Valley is on maximizing the benefits of a healthy ecosystem. Often, in fact, uh, including here locally, although I think we're shifting away from this, we have this ideal of restoring these systems to pre-Euro-American settlement. Um, However, I think it's increasingly recognized that this is really unrealistic. Our climate's not the same, the landscape's not the same. We no longer have these braided channels. So um, I think now people think about it more in terms of just trying to restore some of those important ecosystem functions like stormwater control, but then also trying to make, maximize a large amount of biodiversity. If ex-urban natural spaces can provide crucial services to an urban population, then conservation plans do not need to be at odds with urban development plans. Instead, scenarios can be envisioned that allow for the urban growth that is inevitable and foster the healthy, diverse prairie habitats that have sustained human populations in the Willamette Valley for thousands of years.